Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of Clarity and Confidence TV. This week, this is when it's going live, is National Infertility Awareness Week. And so I have a special episode and a special friend and guest, Ashley Herring. She is a manager and executive assistant at a national nonprofit and research organization. And she is here to tell us her story to advocate for infertility warriors everywhere and to talk about how important this issue is for women at work. And it's not just about infertility advocacy, but also about um, helping women just show up and, and be able to tell the truth so they can show up as their most confident selves at work. So Ashley, welcome. I would love if you just wanna start by just start from the beginning, just tell us your story about you and DJ and how you got here and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, a little bit about me. Um, my husband and I got married in 2011 and we had these ideas of, you know, getting married and starting a family and thinking it was going to be just an easy flow like it had been for everybody that I knew. So going into it, we're like, oh yeah, well, you know, wait six months, but then we'll dive right into it. So we yeah. were ready to just start a family as soon as we got married and it didn't work out that way for us. Um, shortly, you know, we waited, we tried for about a year, year and a half, I think it was. And then we decided to have a talk with my OBGYN and, um, it's where I was diagnosed with infertility through PCOS, which is polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, and we had started out with just, there's a pill you can take. It's called Clomid. We thought, well, okay, well that's easy, right? You can just take a pill, um, couple, a few days, you know, check to see if you've been ovulating and have a kid that way. So, we did that. It wasn't a big deal. Um, I did get some bad side effects from that more so than with any other fertility treatment that I had, which I was shocked by. Like yeah. a lot of my hair fell out, ah. um, some, like no fun things that I wasn't expecting from a pill. So, yeah. but we did that for, um, three months and, um, I just wasn't producing eggs. Um, they were able to do a vaginal ultrasound to kind of see like, um, if my eggs were growing, if my follicles were getting bigger to be able to get pregnant and, um, I wasn't able to. So then we're like, okay, well what's next. And that's when my OBGYN had referred me to a reproductive specialist or a fertility doctor. Um, and so I was able to get into a fertility clinic, but there's a wait, you know, once yeah. you get in, you have to have your initial consult. So you wait a few months for that too. So now it's just like in my head, like time is ticking by. So it's a little, it's a little harder, you know, when you're thinking about it, it really hasn't been, you know, much more longer than you originally started trying, but, um, time, time, you age to, math. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm very like type A, I like, I have things planned out. So when things don't go to plan, I, I start to spire also I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. well, here we go. Here's a new challenge. So we um, got in to see our fertility doctor, um, where we had decided, well, we will try um, IUI, which is where they take his sperm and um, they run tests on that and kind of select the best sperm. And then um, you're basically inseminated. Um, you take hormones, of course. So I was on the, the gonal F and the shots and they monitor everything. Um, they make sure that you're not gonna ovulate. Um, so with work and everything, that's uh, it can be a little tough because if they find out in the morning when you go get tested by, you know, 10 a.m., they give you a call and they'll say, oh my gosh, we think you're going to ovulate. You have to go get this prescription right now and you've got to take this shot and um, work. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard when you're at work and your husband has to come within yeah. like 30 minutes to give you a shot. And we ended up doing it in the parking lot a couple yep. of times, like <laughs> with my pants pulled down in the back of the lot. <laughs> Doing it in the parking lot quick. is so not what you thought it was going to be, you know? No, no. I mean, the traditional way versus this way, there's a lot of difference there. So not as romantic. No. Um, a lot more pain. Yeah. Um, so we did IUI um, four times, actually. Four times we did that. Um, and then we always thought IVF was something that was kind of unreachable because it's mm -hmm. so expensive. Um, we really did educate ourselves on the cost difference between IUI and IVF. Um, later we found out we would have saved money if we did IUI in the first or IVF in the first place, because we wouldn't have had to take all those hormones every month. Cause basically if you get enough eggs from 
one uh, retrieval and IVF, then you can do multiple transfers with those. So um, hindsight, but it all, you know, <laughs> it's fine. We, uh, we finally met with um, some friends that had IVF. They were really the only couple that we knew that had infertility issues and they had successful pregnancy. They actually had twins. Mm -hmm. And so when we started that journey, um, now this was like in, we decided to switch to IVF. We're now in like 2016. Um, we had spoke with them and kind of gathered some inf information and found out what their um, journey was like with IVF and decided, yeah, let's, let's give it a go. Let's go this route. And if it doesn't work out, you know, it doesn't work out, but this will be like our last ditch effort. Mm -hmm. So we went in, um, and did our retrieval in 2017, um, where they retrieved like 43 eggs for me. <laughs> it was, it was really crazy. What? I mean, I felt like a hen in a hen house. I was like, what? So, and it was very painful. <laughs> uh, I, yes. Yes. Yeah. So we we're excited about that. They ended up taking um, 15 of those after they, after they did the whole like inseminating in the Petri dish and growing into blastocyst or embryos. Um, they did five and six day mm -hmm. trans, or I'm not sure what you call it. Yeah. Five yeah. day, six day embryos mm -hmm. um, with those. And we had uh, 15 good, wow. well graded. Um, embryos that they then froze mm -hmm. and then they said my best chance was to freeze those and then next cycle start fresh and then do the transfer then mm -hmm. so in um 2017 in the fall we did our first ivf transfer from um one of the embryos and the for people that don't know like usually the clinic just picks like the prettiest embryo is how it works. And that's what goes first. They say it's a beauty contest basically. Yeah. So yeah. Um, they just picked whatever embryo it was. We didn't have any um, testing done. Some people do PGS testing or um, uh, it's called like, cro not chromosome yeah. testing, abnormality testing. Yeah. So we didn't do any of that. Um, we didn't want to know the sexes of each embryo and we thought well if we got pregnant naturally we wouldn't know if there were any abnormalities anyway so it was kind of you know our last ditch effort and we ended up um getting pregnant and we had our son june 2018. <laughs> so that was a huge success story for us but i felt like our journey like didn't end there it wasn't like oh we have a baby um I think a lot of things people don't talk about is when you do go through infertility treatments and you even have a baby, there are a lot of um, things you take with you that you would have never thought about. Like I had post-traumatic or not, sorry, uh, I had a postpartum yeah. and I didn't think I did at the time, but my postpartum was not like me not liking my child. It all st stemmed around like me thinking something was going to happen to him. Like oh, any, yeah. I couldn't be away from him for a second. Like I was like, I don't deserve this baby. Like I couldn't have him naturally. Like something's going to go wrong because that's how it had been. Mm -hmm. So it's a little emotional talking about it because it yeah. seems so real going through. And like, even when my husband would have him, like I would have thoughts of like, is he hurting him? What's he doing? Like, mm -hmm. and I went through a C-section. So there, I was limited in what I could do anyway, which just added, added to yeah. the, to it being traumatic. So um, I don't think a lot of people know that when, when I explain, um, to like my friends that are doulas and they're like, oh, that makes sense. Like I hear that all the time from people that struggle with fertility and infertility, and then they ha get pregnant and have a baby. Like there are still some emotional things that are sure. really different from, um, couples that are fertile and just conceive naturally that they don't think about. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm sure, you know, they also can have issues like that too, but it's something I never really thought about until it happened to me. And I didn't really, really think about it until later. And I was like, oh, I was acting a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and sure. overprotective. Yeah. But um, so got past that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we wanted to try right away again. Um, so we were um, six months. I stopped breastfeeding so I could prepare my body to get pregnant again. Then we came in to find out that um, my husband's insurance um, no longer covered the clinic we were at. So another roadblock there. Um, and since 
we loved our clinic, you know, we got pregnant. There was a lot of like emotional attachment to that as well. We had to transfer our embryos to a new clinic and establish relationships with that doctor and the staff there. And mm -hmm. um, it was a little extra, it took a little extra time to, um, to do that and to be like mentally prepared to, because my big thing is like, even before my transfers, I like to get in like my Zen place. I get a massage the day before yeah. I have this weird, um, this weird, uh, tradition where I buy like a bamboo plant. I don't, nobody told me to do that. I don't know what happened. It just so happened. I bought a bamboo plant and they got pregnant. <laughs> I think I've told you that before. You that, yeah. Yeah. I bought a bamboo plant and they got pregnant with my son. So then it like just kind of carried on. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'm like superstitious, but I think I am. Like I never really noticed it until a lot of this. So you just like some weird to do stuff. things that will ensure your success, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so once we finally got everything transferred to our new clinic and established that relationship and did our first, um, our first consult with the doctor, um, we, um, we found out that I had to have like a small procedure done because I had some scar tissue and stuff like in my uterus. So they did a, um, a procedure, which was just another roadblock it was another cycle gone by, you know, and I'm here trying to check my boxes like, okay, I want to do this, this and that. So, um, we did our second transfer, which, um, didn't result in a pregnancy. So of course that was heartbreaking. Um, I just kind of had a feeling like I had like weird cramps from the beginning. So I had a feeling it wasn't going to work, but it was very heartbreaking to relive what happened before I had my son, you know, cause you're like all joyful that you're pregnant. You're like, Oh, IVF works, but you know, it's seldom that it's going to work every single time in a row from what I hear. So um, so then we had to, you know, wait another month. And then, um, at that time, the doctor had said, um, well, maybe we want to do some, some other, um, procedures that might help. And I just had this like weird feeling like, no, like, I'm not going to do that. I just want to try again without doing anything else. Mm -hmm. So, um, cause they had diagnosed me with like endometriosis. So I was like, no, like, I'm just going to do it. Well, then from our third transfer, um, I was sick. Like I got sick like two days before and I was like, Oh no, <laughs> it's going to like run everything. So I called the doctor, met with her and she's like, you know, you being healthy is like the best thing. Like, you know, my advice would be just to wait, cancel this and we'll, we'll just schedule the next month. But something in me is like, I just have a really good feeling about this. You know, a lot of times we go by our intuition with things and, um, I said, okay, I'm not 100%. This was pre COVID. So now like yeah. if you're sick, they probably wouldn't let you in. Right. <laughs> so right. Back yeah. when the rules were different. Um, so yeah, I was still like not feeling best. I didn't have a fever or anything like that, but I did like a couple days before and I went ahead and I did the transfer and we got our pregnancy test back and it was uh, positive. So we were excited. Um, and happy. We have a girl that was born May of 2020. So now our family is complete. Like our big thing was like, cause I'm a planner. So we, yeah. my husband and I were like, oh yeah, if we could have kids, we would have a boy and a girl and they'd be close in age. And I was like, you know, we did it. We took, yeah. a, it was a long windy road, but the end result, like we got, we got what we like had always hoped and prayed for. So I know not everybody's journey ends like that. So it's, it's a happy ending for us. And now we are at, um, a new stage because now we're, we're families finalized. Like we're happy where we're at. We've got two kids, two expensive kids, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two healthy kids. And we are, um, working on donating our remaining embryos, which we have 12 of them. So we're going through that process now, which is a whole challenge of its own and something I never knew existed. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I never knew that was an option for people. And so it's been really, a really cool process to go through because they give you the options of like, you can discard your embryos, you can donate them to science, you can, um, donate them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we started with an agency and now we are going through and like privately finding people. We've, um, started the, um, legal agreements with two couples already. And so we're still out there looking for a third couple for our embryos, but it's a really cool process. Um, 
we have it set up in our agreement so that it's like an open relationship so that if our kids ever want to meet, they can meet their bio siblings. And um, yeah, just another journey. Wow. It just continues. It just <laughs> so. continues. All the things you would never think about. And there's so many things I'm going to come back to. And as you and I talked, I want to also share the contrasting story. And then we're going to come back to Ashley because she has so many more nuggets of wisdom to share. But some of you are know my infertility journey. And for others of you, um, I'm going to tell you about a journey that's very opposite of Ashley's and how they can both turn out okay. Um, I had my daughter when I was 24 with no complications. I don't even think I tried to get pregnant. I think I thought about pregnancy and I was pregnant, you know, um, was, you know, married at the time, very young, um, had her easy pregnancy, just everything was just like, well, this is just easy. So probably the opposite of what you and DJ thought, right? Like, we're just going to get married. We're going to think about having kids and boop, they're going to pop out. Well, that happened to me the first time. And then everything just went crazy. So um, when she was about nine months old, I got pregnant on accident. Um, I had a miscarriage at 15 weeks. Um, a couple of years later, I got pregnant again. Um, and I had a miscarriage at about seven or eight weeks. Um, about a year after that, I got pregnant again. Again, all of these were like accidental pregnancies. So I mean, like, getting pregnant at the time was not the problem. Um, and found out that one was ectopic. Um, about a year after that, my first marriage ended. Um, fast forward five years, I, you know, meet my wonderful husband, Jason, and similar to, to Ashley and DJ, they, we got married and we're like, well, as soon as, you know, we get married, we're just going to get pregnant. This will happen in a year. No problem. I bet now that I'm with the person I'm supposed to be with, this will all just be magically easy. And then it wasn't. <laughs> so we'd been trying for about a year. And the difference I think between me and Ashley is um, I was considered advanced maternal age. So I was already, I think 39 or, um, or had just turned 39 when we started seeking fertility treatments. And so we've been trying for a year, wasn't getting pregnant, did all of the tests. And so, you know, I was one of those cases that was true unexplained infertility, test normal, Hormones, normal. Scans, normal. Everything, normal. No history of endometriosis or PCO, like none of it, right? I mean, the, they're just like, we, we just don't know. And so they just chalked it up to my age, right? You know, you're just older, you got old eggs, right? My eggs are geriatric. Um, and so we tried IUI once, failed, and we went straight to IVF just because we knew that, um, you know, given my age, that was probably the next best step. Um, we are lucky in that um, our spouses work for an employer, and I'll just say their name, Wells Fargo, because people are looking for employers like this, who have fertility coverage. And IVF wasn't something that we were thinking we were even interested in, but you know, since you know Wells Fargo had such a generous fertility package, we're like, let's just go talk to the doctor. So, you know, we went and met with our um, physician. We decided, you know what, let's just give it a try. Uh, went through IVF the first time. I did not get 43 eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even imagine. I think I got three eggs or four eggs. Um, and then, so of course, you know, they do uh, the, the matching and, you know, we got a day five embryo, but in my case, we had to send them off to genetic testing, which insurance did cover because given my advanced maternal age, the likelihood that an embryo would have um, genetic defects was, was quite high. So we did the genetic testing and um, came back and that first embryo was not genetically normal. It, it was likely that if they would have transferred it, it would not have implanted at all. There's no way it could have been normal. Um, so we were crushed of course, because we're like, oh, I mean, and as you know, you go through all the hormones, all the anticipation, all the things and, you know, to find out that like, it didn't work. So we're like, oh, so we still had some insurance money left. And so we went back to our um, doctor and she said, well, let's try a different combination of drugs. We actually did um, something they call mini IVF, which is I didn't use as strong of drugs because they didn't, they knew I wasn't like Ashley. I was at age almost 40. I was not going to make 43 eggs. Like there was just, that was just not going to be a thing. So they decided, well, let's just try to get just a few eggs, but let's try to make them as high quality as possible. 
So we did that approach. It worked wonderful. I think we got four eggs this time and we got two embryos. And when we sent both embryos to genetic testing, we were praying that one of them would be normal and both of them were normal. So we were feeling really good. COVID hit, delayed my cycle because you know they're not doing any transfers during COVID. So we had to wait again. So talk about clock ticking, right? I'm sitting here thinking like, I'm gonna turn 40. I'm gonna turn 40, I'm gonna turn 40, right? Like, so it's like all those things. Um, we then transferred an embryo in June of, would have been 2020, uh, end of May, 2020. Um, and I got pregnant. I was super excited. I was pregnant for oh, a couple week, week and a half, a couple weeks. And we found out I miscarried again. And I was just like, oh, and you know, just the frustration, right. Of knowing you have a genetically perfect embryo, there's nothing wrong with me. Why, why does this keep happening? But we were still hope folks were like, we have, we have one more left. Okay. Um, and so we knew the remaining was, was a girl. I miscarried the boy. We knew the remaining one was a girl. And so in September of 2020, we transferred that one. Um, and unfortunately that one did not stick as, as I don't know a better way to say it other than it just didn't, yeah. it didn't stick. Um, maybe because I didn't buy a bamboo plant. I don't know. I bought it for my first one, but not the second one. And so, I mean, that was just crushing because it was just like, even though the miscarriage was like so devastating and such a loss, like when the second one didn't implant, like that one was just like a punch in the gut because we're like, oh my God, like this is, this is over. You know, we don't have any more left. And so, you know, we just kind of did all of our grieving all the things, you know, went on with our lives. Um, in what is it, April, um, early March of this year, we found out that I somehow got pregnant on my own. We couldn't believe it. Like we were like, oh my gosh, you know, here I am almost 41 years old. Like this is a miracle. And I wasn't even worried. I was just like, oh my gosh, if this happened on our own, like this is, this is going to work. And a week later <laughs> I miscarried again. And I think, you know, um, you know, Ashley and I are, you know, we were talking before I hit record that it's, you know, a good side by side story of how you can go through IVF and everything works out and you get kids and everything's great. And you can go through IVF. And while, you know, I have a 16 year old now and, you know, Jason adores his stepdaughter, we wanted to have kids together and it didn't work out and it can still be okay. And a preg positive pregnancy test is not a success stick. We can still have a successful marriage, even though there's not kids, even no matter what society says, right? About you should get married and then have kids and that, you know, all the things. And so um, for anybody who's listening just to the stories right now, I just, if I have anything, I want you all to know that no matter how it turns out, like you can still be okay. So um, I want Ashley though, I think one of the things that's really important is just what it's like to be one of the one in eight, what it's like to work while you're undergoing fertility treatments, what employers should do, what you need. Just tell us what you want women to know about being, you know, working and doing fertility treatments. Yeah, absolutely. So when we started this journey, um, I feel like there was a lot of shame. Like you mm -hmm. said, like we viewed it as like, Hey, this is what women are supposed to do. This is what married couples are supposed to do. And when we couldn't do it, mm -hmm. it was devastating to us. And I chose the path of not telling anybody. I mean, my friends and my family didn't know even my parents and my sisters. I mean, we kept it a secret between us. And part of that was because I was ashamed. We were just kind of more so me than my husband, you know, but I was ashamed that I couldn't do something that I felt like God made my body for, you know, this is a natural thing. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm very like driven by results and I wasn't getting the result I wanted. And it was, to me, it felt shameful, but in thinking about it now, I mean, of course, that's not how it should be. Like you said, like a positive pregnancy test, that's, that's not like, a, something you have to check off your bucket list yeah. you know it's yeah. not something that makes you you're not you know your children are a part of you but they're not what makes you mm -hmm. and you know everybody's story is different and you know you grow stronger from when you can't do something and you find a way to you know make your make your life have meaning no matter what you know growing up I wasn't one of those one of the um 
kids that like was like, oh, I can't wait to get married and have kids. Like that's my life goal. I hear that all the time from women, but that was never me. Like I never knew that something I wanted until I couldn't have it, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so in not my family, not knowing, and of course my work didn't know it yeah. was really hard for us <laughs> to do all these things and not say anything. And, you know, it wasn't like we had to remind ourselves not to say anything. We just made it something like between us, but the stress of like holding it in yeah. um, and saying like, oh, I feel I'm sick calling into work sick that day because you have to go to your IVF transfer. You know, there's something that makes you feel bad about that anyway. Right. Like, I don't want to be somebody that that's lying about what I'm doing. Um, if I could go back in time, I think I would own up to, um, who I was and be more confident about like, Hey, you know, like I'm, I, you know, I'm having this issue, but you know, I'm going through and I'm trying to find, you know, a journey that works for us and, um, make sure that, you know, if we did want to keep the details private, being able to have the confidence to say like, Hey, I'm out today for a private appointment. I'm, um, you know, my parents asked about having kids, you know, as they did often because yeah, the only grandchildren are my kids now. So we got pressured pretty hardcore. Yeah. And, you know, there were times where I had to say like, quit asking us about this. Mm-hmm. But I think if I did it more early on, maybe it would have helped a little bit, especially with our friends. You know, I would just kind of zone out and hear their kid talk mm-hmm. versus like say like, hey, you know, mm-hmm. I, you know, it's not something I want to talk about right now. Or, you know, mm-hmm. DJ and I are on a different path something along those lines. So I think it's just normalizing people's fertility um, journeys and infertility journeys, um, being private and being okay, not, not digging for details with that. Um, at work, like I said, it was tough. Parking lot, needles in the, in the butt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the uh, last minute trips um, to the um, clinic, um, calling in sick. Um, even when we had things planned months in advance, you know, I was too afraid to like take that day off as it would throw a red flag out to my employer. Like, oh, why is she like scheduling one day off, you know, and have the opportunity for them to be like, Hey, I know you have that day for vacation, but I'm going to need you to come in anyway. It was a lot easier for me, which might not be the right thing, but was to just call in sick that day. So I could take care of things personal. And I'm, I'm very like career driven and I love my job. And so that really weighed on me as well as like our infertility journey as well. Um, And you're just explaining it so well. And when I talk to other women about the burden of secrecy, right? And so I think sometimes when we have to keep part of ourselves a secret, it really keeps us from showing up as our most confident selves at work, right? Because there's always like this underlying, I don't know about you, but this underlying um, narrative that's going on in my head that's like, oh gosh, okay, what are they thinking? What are they thinking about me not showing up? You know, are they going to know? Are they going to know what's going on? I mean, just all of that. And I think sometimes we underestimate how much of that women carry at work. You know, when um, I was talking to another woman, she goes, I know what it's like to sit in a meeting or to get a phone call from my doctor, which I did. I still remember getting a phone call from my doctor um, that my second transfer didn't work, sobbing, and then having to like get my shit together because I had to go present and do a leadership training 45 minutes later, you know, and managing just those tensions at work. And I think sometimes, you know, when, like you say, if it's something you can be open about, it just provides a safe place for your emotions. And when you feel safe at work, you can show up as your best self. So what do you think employers need to do to provide more support for the one in eight women going through this and their spouses? Because I don't want to pretend like this didn't affect our spouses because it did. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, the leadership stops, starts at the top and a big message is places like Wells Fargo that offer fertility insurance that kind of opens the door and opens the welcome to like, Hey, we see you, we see Mm -hmm. you struggling and we want to help. So little things like that, I feel like make you more comfortable at work and make you more comfortable talking about your issues because you know, it's something your, your work and your employment and your career supports. Mm -hmm. from the very get-go, like, oh, we're going to support you by providing you money to take care of it. And they know it's going to cost them a lot of money. It's going to cost them your time off of work. And they're still willing to do that. Mm -hmm. I think also um, 
not having employees tell you every detail about their personal life, leaving the door open for them. Like, hey, I'm here if you ever want to discuss anything, but not being like, what's going on? Or making assumptions mm -hmm. like I actually bled with both of my pregnancies. And of course it happened at work. And I'm talking a lot of blood, both at six weeks exactly. It's the weirdest thing. Yeah. But I had to like leave work like an emergency. And you know, I came back and um some coworkers were like, I called my mom and I said, I think she had a miscarriage when they didn't even know I was going through everything. And just like assumptions that people have because you have to leave, you know, I think I think being supportive doesn't mean you have to guess what people are going through. You don't have to pressure them to tell you, but you can open the door with like, hey, you know, I'm a listening ear if you ever want to talk about anything or here are, you know, some resources that we have with HR, someone you can contact about benefits or, you know, we have a um, employee line that you can reach out to or, you know, if you're having issues and we provide, you know, this kind of insurance and um, those kind of things will help. But I think asking people to tell you details or pressuring people to tell you mm -hmm. if they're pregnant or not pregnant or the test, you know, I think is hard. And if you haven't gone through it, you know, and you've only, only have friends that are naturally fertile, yeah. it's, it's a lot different. Cause then, you know, you're like, Oh yeah, I think I'm pregnant. Then you're like, Oh yeah. You're like, are you pregnant? And it's like a normal thing, but for women and men that have fertility issues, um, it, it can be hard. And I think it's the same with men too. If you offer something for men or women, then you should offer, you know, this likewise for men. And that even goes to families that don't want to have kids. Like, I feel like employers should think about doing, covering procedures like vasectomies and um, tubal lit ligations. I don't know if I'm saying that right now. Yeah. Um, having your tube side, those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even men too, like Jason said, um, we had shared a story out on, on Facebook and even Jason said, that he goes, this is just not something I ever thought I would have to even think about, right? So, I mean, like, while men may not admit it as much, there's still all those emotions that they go through, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that you're saying without actually saying it is, you know, just make it okay for people to have private appointments on their calendars, normalize it. Yes. And you don't need to dig in and ask a bunch of details. And one of the best ways you can foster that environment at work is to model that yourself. If you manage employees and they have private appointments on their calendars, you know, offer support without prying. So thank you so much for sharing your story. What else? Is there anything else that I didn't ask you or we didn't talk about that you think is just really important for, you know, women or employers to know? I just think that, you know, being yourself and, you know, doing what you can and asking for help when you need help, not being afraid to do that or touching base with people that you know have struggled with fertility. Um, all those are great things. And, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any direct questions to ask me as well. I think it's important to, um, there's, there's groups on Facebook. Um, if you're having um, troubles getting pregnant or have questions, there's also groups on Facebook. There are support groups. Um, I know some hospitals, they have flyers and links. I don't know how much is going on in person now with COVID, but, you know, I'd be happy to try to find um, more information for people looking, but, you know, it's okay. You're going to be okay no matter what. And we, we can do hard things. And this is a really, really hard thing to do and go Especially through. for type A planners learning that yes. they can't predict when their next monitoring appointment will yes. be. Yeah. Uh, where can they get, what's the best place? If you said they had questions, what would be the best place for them to find you? Um, you can reach me. I'll give you my personal email. It's Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y, B as in boy, last name Herring. So H-E-R-R-I-N-G, Ashley B Herring at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to, to answer any questions you have or provide advice. I mean, limited advice, but if you have any just general questions about the process or places you can go, I'll be happy to Awesome. Help. And y'all know where to find me on social media. Yeah. So. Thank you, Ashley, for, you know, sharing your story and just being so vulnerable about the process and just using your voice to advocate for women at work. Thank and you, too, Kelly. You've done so much yeah. already. So I love hearing all the stuff you're doing to advocate for women. Oh, thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us and reach out to either one of us if you have any questions.